Okay, hi everyone. Thanks for joining. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, so today uh, we're doing part three of CAT Management's spring webinar series on sustainable HOAs. And today our topic is on community sustainability. We have two guest speakers for today's topic. Spencer King and Andy Jaleski are both graduate students and sustainability consultants for CAT Management who will be presenting material on principles of community resilience, as well as tools and tactics for building community within HOAs. The two presentations uh, will run about 30 minutes and then we'll have a question and answer session immediately after. So if a question comes to mind during the presentations, uh, please use the ask a question feature by clicking on the bubble with the question mark and simply type in your question and hit enter. And we'll leave some time at the end to respond to each of those. Also under the handouts tab, you will find a one page PDF that highlights some of the key concepts and takeaways from today's presentation. So before we get started, um, I'd like to just give a, another short introduction to the sustainable HOA series. So my name is Chris Mary and I'm the chief sustainability officer for cat management. Uh, when I started this position, my work was focused typically on traditional sustainability projects which was mostly analyzing water and energy consumption for HOAs and recommending best strategies for conservation. But shortly after I completed that first wave of projects, we found value in extending this concept of sustainability beyond just the environmental opportunities, but also to the financial and social aspects of the community as well. So this concept is known as the triple bottom line of financial, environmental, and social. And it's a term that sort of originated in the business world to describe a company's strategy that considers not just the profitability of an organization, but also the environmental impact, as well as the well being of its employees and other stakeholders. So we found this also to be a useful way of working with HOA communities. HOAs operate a lot like a not for profit real estate company, and the viability of the HOA community really depends heavily on how it's financially managed. Environmentally speaking, HOAs have a big opportunity to conserve water, uh, making energy efficiency upgrades and providing recycling and composting services to the residents. But lastly, and for today's topic, we're talking about how HOAs are also a residential community. At the, the end of the day, it's a place that millions of Coloradans call their home. And we believe that HOAs can play an important role in encouraging meaningful resident engagement while also building a sense of community. But in order to really understand the potential of HOA communities in the context of the triple bottom line and sustainability, we found that the most useful first step is to change the conversation around HOAs. CAT Management is, is an established HOA management company of nearly 20 years. So we know firsthand that management of HOA communities can be problematic from time to time. Volunteer board members are handed over a huge amount of responsibility and their decisions really have a significant effect on the living experience of all residents in that community. And these good intentions can be bogged down by day-to-day -day challenges, might include challenges with parking, architectural review, problematic homeowners, or trouble collecting a special assessment. But we believe that homeowners association communities can be used to talk about other things like financial sustainability, collective environmental action, community building, resilience, and healthy living. So we wanna talk about ways to create sustainable communities that are financially resilient, environmentally responsible, and a great place to call home. So if you're a board member or HOA resident, I would encourage you to set aside some of these less fun aspects of HOA living during this presentation, and instead think about how your HOA can be used as a tool rather than a roadblock to elevate the living experience in your community. So with that, I'd like to hand it off to Spencer King. Spencer is a sustainability consultant and graduate student at CU Boulder, and he's part of a graduate student team working to create the first ever guidebook for sustainability within the HOA industry. And today he's gonna to cover the principles of community resiliency and some examples of resilience in practice. Okay, Spencer, you should have control of the slides now. It's all yours, thanks. All right, thanks, Chris. So today we're talking about community. I think sometimes it is helpful to zoom out and then zoom back in on what we're talking about. So when we talk about community, it might mean a hundred different things to a hundred different people, whether that's 
a community of neighbors or of people that live in the same city or region or of people that share similar cultural identities. Today, when we talk about community, we'll be following this definition, a place-based group that shares common needs, resources, and risks. And in this case, individuals or families living in an HOA. Next slide, please. So last week we talked about sustainability for the environment, but what does that sustainability of a community look like? Community resilience and community sustainability are very similar. Resilience is the ability of a community to absorb or adapt to shocks and stresses and continue to function with limited interruptions. In the case of a severe disruption, a resilient community will be able to bounce back more quickly than one that is not. Shocks are sudden, unexpected things like natural disasters, and stresses are long-term issues like an economic recession or a drought. Resilience takes planning, and the more community input there is, the stronger the plan will be. You can think of resilience as having a spare tire in your car. It's a minor inconvenience to replace a flat tire, but entirely disrupting to have nothing to replace it with. But having just a spare tire wouldn't be very well-rounded resilience plan. You'd need tools like a wrench and a car jack, and these additional tools are like the additional perspectives in your community. Next slide, please. HOAs are well suited to build community resilience because of their structure and the well-established nature of it. HOAs are a form of small-scale governance, meaning they have a better opportunity to quickly respond and adapt to the needs of their community. Knowing your neighbors can help build community resilience. When you know your neighbors, it increases the social cohesion of the community, which in turn builds trust and willingness to help each other can also help save money, whether it's just borrowing a cup of sugar from a neighbor, a tool for a project, or collectively paying for services like trash or compost pickup. So why does resilience matter? Um, there are few cases more salient than the 1995 Chicago heat wave, which was one of the most lethal environmental disasters in American history with 739 heat-related deaths over a period of five days. The severity of the effects of the heat wave was largely determined by economic status of various neighborhoods. Generally, neighborhoods with a higher rate of poverty had higher rates of heat-related death or hospitalization. Two neighborhoods, Inglewood and Auburn Gresham, were very similar on paper, both with similar high levels of poverty and similar risks. However, Auburn Gresham's fatality rate was among the lowest of all of Chicago, including the wealthy neighborhoods. This was because Auburn Gresham's residents had more interaction and were more likely to check in on one another and provide support to those that needed it. Additionally, across the city, neighborhoods that had better access to public spaces fared better than those that didn't. Overall, the takeaway here is that neighborhoods with better social cohesion built stronger community resilience and were able to adapt to the severe heat. As I just mentioned, shared community spaces can help foster community resilience. Having a shared common area is an essential part of a vibrant community, whether that's a park, a community garden, a building lobby, or even just a walkway. Creating a space for people to comfortably interact with one another can strengthen your community and instill a sense of place. A strong sense of place in one's community can help make people care more for their HOA and for their neighbors. A strong, a common place can also help build an identity for your HOA. A strong identity is important for establishing pride for one's community and for building social cohesion of the community. However, it's not enough to just have a common space. The space has to be inclusive and inviting for everyone in the community. And this is especially poignant now in the context of COVID-19. A common space, especially one that is open air, allows for safe social interaction outside of one's home. 
So some key factors for successful common areas are that it needs to be successful or accessible so that people of all abilities, ages, or genders can access the space. Comfortable. The space has to be safe, clean, and have an availability of places to sit and is attractive with greenery, art, or other pleasing features. Has activities, which are the main reason that people are drawn to common places in the first place and why they return. Whether it's sports, gardening, or simply relaxing, having multiple choices for people of all abilities to recreate enhances the vibrancy and attractiveness of the space. And finally, sociability. The common space needs to have a place that people want to meet and bring people to. Successful common areas can make people feel at home and foster a sense of belonging in one's community. So it's no secret that many residents are disengaged from their HOA and feel like they don't have a say in what happens within their community. To remedy this, it's important to have effective and redundant forms of communication so that residents feel included and have a platform to speak their mind, voice concerns, and bring new ideas that can benefit the whole community. A study conducted in 2014 regarding sustainable communities found that community engagement is one of the best and most transformative tools to build sustainable communities. Effective community engagement has many benefits, including increased problem solving capacity through the inclusion of more perspectives, deeper and more robust understanding of issues facing the community, reduced long-term costs with projects as fewer conflicts arise, improved resident board relations, and increased support of plans and projects. And with that, I will hand it over to Andy. Great, thanks Spencer. Sorry for the technical difficulties. I think we got it figured out though. Um, so remember, if anyone has a question, please uh, go ahead and enter it into the uh, question feature and we will get to those at the end. Uh, so next up we have Andy Jaleski. Andy is part of the same graduate student consulting team from CU Boulder, uh, where he's working towards completion of a master's program in sustainability planning and management. Andy is gonna discuss some of the more practical tools and tactics that HOAs can use to build the social capital at the neighborhood scale. Okay, Andy, just one moment, I'll pass it off to you. Okay, Andy, it's all yours. All right, thank you, Chris. So today I'm gonna to talk about communication. So successful communities start with good communication. Regular communication builds social capital, encourages participation, creates networks, reciprocity, and builds trust. Ultimately, good communication leads to success. So communication should be frequent, clear, and concise. In addition, active listening is essential for good communication, and it's important to consider the audience and their needs. Communication should be conducted across all levels so that res residents can stay informed and have the opportunity to participate. So there are many different effective methods of communication, both virtual and in person. Uh, one method that we use is social media groups. So CAP Management created Facebook groups for many of its communities, which has allowed for residents to communicate with each other on issues in real time and has helped residents connect and get to know each other. Other social media platforms such as Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn can be useful tools in building social connection between residents. CAP created a sustainable HOA LinkedIn group where you can connect with pioneers and professionals in the HOA and sustainability industry. In addition to social media, newsletters and regular emails from the HOA management company to residents can help keep its people up to date and build trust. If residents feel cared for and informed, they will place more trust in their HOA. So CAP Management is currently transitioning to a software called Appfolio, which will provide a one-stop shop for all HOA-related business for residents and HOA board members, which will help will improve communication. And finally, regular meetings such as an HOA board meetings help to foster and establish this connection. Meetings are a powerful way to establish social capital, 
and get to know others in your community while coming together to collaborate on shared issues. Residents should have clear instructions on how to contact HOA board members and their management company. However, we've seen best results for communication come from a multitude of strategies and using multiple methods. So in addition to providing valuable assistance to an HOA board, committees involve more stakeholders with personal experience in the governance process, resulting in stronger and more involved community. They also provide committee members with valuable experience in association governance and are a hands-on training ground for new community leaders. For example, committee members can range from committees can range from updating lighting fixtures in public areas to advocating for sustainability. So there are two types of committees. The first is a standing committee. Standing committees work regularly on HOA business, such as an architectural review or landscape decisions. And then there's a special or task committee. And these help with a one-time project, such as roof replacement or a hiring of a new management company. Steps for creating a community. When you start with uh, trying to create a committee, you first need to prove that there's sufficient interest in the topic. So if you have an idea, you need to talk to your neighbors uh, and your friends to see if they believe that this is a good idea for the community. And once you get people on board, you, should, you need to create a charter. And this establishes the purpose and logistics of the proposed committee. Once you have a charter, you would bring it to the HOA board where they review and make any necessary adjustments. After this period, board members will vote on the creation of the committee. And if successful, um, the board members will appoint members to the committee or establish an application process. So if you're a resident and looking to start a committee, some advice off the bat is if you don't know where to start, lean on your management company and your HOA board and ask for help. If your proposal uh, meets has some friction, try to find some common ground because someone may not see the benefit of the project from your perspective, but that if you could help them see other benefits, um, it may be easier to go through. And finally, understanding government documents, while not required, uh, 100% uh, can aid in, your, in the process if you have some understanding. So an example of a resident who's created an HOA committee by oneself is in Phyllis West, which is an HOA managed by CAP in Lafayette, Colorado. So with guidance from, from CAP management, a Villas West resident, Jenny, has created a sustainable, sustainable community committee. The purpose of this sustainable community committee is to encourage greater environmental, social, and physical sustainability. So their primary responsibility is to provide sustainability-oriented recommendations to the association's board of directors to help inform the decision-making process, while also giving power to the residents who aren't board members so their voices can be heard. So Jenny hopes this community can garner a greater sense of participation in the community and then create a greater sense of neighborliness. Her first project is to foster a sense of identity for Villas West by creating a logo that can be used in print and um, online materials and create items such as stickers. Um, something that Jenny said is when you get something like that, it makes you feel like you're part of a team. So, a vital way of fostering community is organizing events. So events are perfect for getting to know your neighbors and fostering community in an organic way. From large events such as block parties, uh, service projects such as neighborhood cleanups, events can be educational, service-based, or just fun. In addition, events could be a way to include renters who can typically be left out of HOA business and feel excluded. So a potential resource for building community is the Sustainable Neighborhood Network. This is a program that's based in the front range and gives residents opportunities to become active partners in increasing the community's vibrancy and sustainability. So the Sustainable Neighborhood Network has resources for organizing events such as workshops and projects that enhance the livability of neighborhoods while also re reducing their ecological footprint. So the Sustainable Neighborhood Network is also a certification program. So each event held that meets criteria of addressing energy, air, water, land, or people 
earns credits based on participation and project accomplishments. So depending on the number of credits earned in a year, a neighborhood could earn a certificate and signage uh, that says either you're a participating sustainable neighborhood or you're an outstanding sustainable neighborhood. So currently, this program operates in neighborhoods in Lakewood, Denver, and Fort Collins. And I encourage you to visit their website and check out their neighborhoods and their past events because uh, they have some great ideas for building community. So despite our current circumstances, you can and should still host events as long as you're following the current public health guidelines. So one way to do this is to utilize video chat software, such as Zoom, Google Hangouts, or FaceTime, to host events such as virtual happy hours, games such as trivia or bingo, or host book club or meetups. And even an in-person socially distanced checkup from your doorway or driveway can boost morale, and these micro interactions can reinforce community and make people feel more connected. Also, if you are healthy and not at risk, reaching out to elderly or immunocompromised neighbors to see if they need anything uh, is vital. Because right now, we need our neighbors now more than ever. As the time is ripe to double down on community building. So even if our events and gatherings need to be different, they are vital for growing a healthy community. So it's important to consider equity when making community decisions. For example, to increase the accessibility of events, um, maybe creating a fund to assist in event costs can increase the quality and number of events as many HOAs are mixed income. Um, in addition, charging for an event could limit who is able to attend. And also scheduling events is important because during the weekday, many people uh, would not be able to attend this event because uh, they're working. So events after work hours or on weekends would ensure greater attendance. So in response to COVID-19, many events have gone uh, online. So it may be wise to make as many events virtual as possible for the foreseeable future. And when it comes to board meetings and committee meetings, uh, we found that the virtual, many have transitioned to virtual and it has increased the number of residents who can attend. So maybe once the current crisis is over, considering a hybrid model where residents can attend virtually will increase the accessibility of the meeting and resident engagement. So in summary, having a strong, healthy community is imperative for ensuring the sustainability and resilience of your HOA. Clear communication, social gatherings, and a shared common space reinforce your HOA's community and sense of place. And also, it is important to consider equity when making community decisions. Because sustainable HOAs are more than just water efficient lawn systems or balanced financial books. It's a collection of people who care about the community and are constantly striving to make it a better place to live. And with that, uh, I'd like to open it up for questions. Great, thanks, Andy. So yeah, I think Andy did a great job at the end, just kind of tying it together with the two other concepts of environmental sustainability as well as financial. And you know, the, the interesting thing about looking at uh, the community part of this equation is that it's, be hard to quantify. It's a little bit different than looking at a, um, you know, a percent funded on a reserve study or simply looking at energy usage or water usage at, a, at an HOA. Um, this is a, a little bit more abstract, um, a little less tangible, but I think at the end of the day, these are really the qualities of the community that, that make an HOA a, a really good place to live and kind of gets a, a sense of that community pride. Um, so, yeah, with that, let me uh, go ahead and look at the questions here and see if we can answer any of the ones that came in. Okay, here's one for, for either of you. Um, Question says, I'm interested in the potential of building community in my HOA, but I'm a fairly new resident. What would you recommend as a first step for me? I guess I'll take this. Uh, well, first I'd recommend getting to know your neighbors. Uh, if it's just like knocking on the door, introducing yourself or um, leaving, bringing a small gift such as food, 
uh, getting to know your neighbors is important uh, to really get the landscape of the HOA. But then after that, I would reach out to your, H uh, your HOA board, attend a meeting and introduce yourself. Um, starting on a good foot goes a long way um, when you're living in an HOA community. Yeah, I think you know one of the first things to do is 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 go to your board meeting, um, get a sense of you know what what are some of the issues that the board is working through. Um, you could also ask to see or to review um, the meeting minutes um, from the HOA for the past several months um, to get an idea of you know what what some of the the issues um, that are either reoccurring or, or new exciting things on deck. Um, I think that would probably be the best way to get started. Also, you can look to see if there's maybe a Facebook group if you're new to the um, community. A lot of large HOAs do have Facebook groups or Nextdoor, as well as another way to, to connect with your neighbors. Okay, here's another one that says, I live in a large HOA in Denver, and we have implemented several sustainability projects over the past few years. Is there a larger network that we can connect with to amplify our efforts? Uh, yeah, there's that uh, sustainability, sustainable community committee uh, website that Andy mentioned, and that should be linked, I think, in the following slide here. Um, so there are some great resources out there for sustainability along HOA lines. So, sorry, uh, just to correct you, Spencer, it's the Sustainable Neighborhood Network. Oh, yeah. Uh, you're so right. They've got lots of great, <laughs> no worries. Uh, they've got lots of great ideas. Uh, for one, all their events, they build community, but all of them are environmentally or conservation focused. Uh, so they're, that's a great way to get some ideas. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, you know, the, the great thing about living in Denver and the front range um, of Colorado here is that there is such an active sustainability community and, and network and there's always something happening. Um, so I think it's just a matter of kind of asking around and seeing, you know, what type of projects you're working with and, you know, if there's any um, any opportunity for collaboration with, you know, a nonprofit or something like that, there's, um, there's likely a way that you can, you know, share your story. Um, and at the end here, I'm going to invite everyone listening to in, to um, uh, join our LinkedIn group, which is a sustainable HOA network that we've created over the past few years, um, where we're trying to connect or to kind of broker these connections between all the, the good work that's happening at the HOA level. So be sure to look at that at the end. Okay, um, here's another uh, question, probably for Andy. Uh, what if I can never go to any hosted events due to work hours? Any suggestions? Yes, definitely. Uh, one thing uh, to do is reach out to the organizers of these events and ask if they can start scheduling them outside of work hours. Uh, another way, if these are more like meeting types of uh, Maybe they can record it, uh, and you can like watch it later. Um, but yeah, I after that, I would, yeah, I would advocate for events, you know, off outside of normal work hours. Yeah, it can be a little tricky. You know, a lot of board meetings are are typically held um, kind of in in the early evenings, and sometimes that can be a you know a challenging time for for people to. Um, to attend, even if they just wanted to sit in on a meeting. Um, one thing that we've noticed as a management company is that since we've moved to virtual meetings, Zoom, GoToMeeting, et cetera, um, in some ways we found a little bit more participation. I think um, it's something that HOA boards might consider um, moving forward is how to you know, structure these meetings, whether it's virtually or live streamed or something, to allow more people to come. Um, one of the you know, big complaints in the HOA industry is, is kind of a, a lack of communication. And I think if people have more opportunities to you know, get in front of the board or at least listen in on some of these decisions that affect their household, um, that would be a, a great tool um, and kind of a long-term um, strategy at you know, enhancing the kind of overall communication in an HOA. 
Okay, here's another question. If I have an idea for a committee and want to be more involved, how should I go about communicating that to my board members? Start by going in with an idea that's, you know, already formed and a charter that's already formed before you get to the board and just be prepared with other members who are interested um, to build support for your idea and ex clearly explain to your board members and engage in that good communication uh, practices that we mentioned, you know, being clear and concise and knowing exactly what you want out of it before you go in. Okay, um, here's another one. As a board member, how can I encourage other residents to participate in board meetings and activities? Yeah, I could take this one. So first, you should make sure that your meetings and events are frequent. So, because I mean, many people have different schedules and having, making sure that people know one, when events are and two, uh, having enough that they can attend at least a couple. Uh, in addition, maybe lowering uh, the barriers to participation. Uh, so as one, uh, having a hybrid model of online versus uh, and in-person meetings uh, to garner more people. And then um, I guess my last suggestion would be to create incentives to participation. Uh, and this could be such as recognizing a committee for doing a great job or uh, highlighting like someone through a very successful events or raise money for charity just kind of calling out uh residents in a positive manner uh can go a long way yeah absolutely okay here's another uh great question that came in what do you think are the most attainable sustainable projects hoas can undertake uh for example stop using pesticides pollinator friendly landscaping energy and water conservation solar panels what have you found to be the most impactful and easiest or the low-hanging fruit? What are the most important and impactful but harder to achieve projects? So that's a big one there. Um, Spencer, Andy, I'll let you guys take the first shot at it and then maybe I'll hop on. What would you guys say is the low-hanging fruit in the HOA industry? I think you, uh, you listed a lot of them out already. Um, yeah, I, I think conservation is certainly one of the easiest things to do in in terms of just using less um, or you know turn off, turning off your lights turning off your faucets you know watering at the coolest parts of the day and not wasting water in that way um, but beyond that um, I mean I, I think there's a huge amount of opportunity to reduce residential food waste, either through kind of an awareness campaign of buying less in the first place or having a compost pickup set up, um, having things like community gardens and that sort of thing are pretty good leverage points for sustainability that are pretty attainable. Yeah, and just to uh, add on to that, I mean, besides conservation, efficiency is the next uh, lowest hanging fruit. So having uh, energy efficient appliances or even just like having like um, making sure your building or your house is as sealed as possible. So the one to retain heat in the winter and keep it cool in the summer. So you don't have to tax your, uh, your energy, your heating and cooling systems as much. I know, uh, Excel Energy has a, a program called Home Energy Squad. We will come in and do an energy audit of your home and kind of give you a baseline of like, how efficient are you in compared to some other uh, members and how can you improve? Uh, so those, that honestly is uh, one of the easiest things you can do besides conservation. Yeah, those are great suggestions. Um, low hanging fruit, it really depends on the, the, the property type of the HOA. Um, so it's hard to say across the board what is, you know, kind of the best um, first project for a, for a community. Um, you know, for example, a large community that has a lot of landscaping and a um, high monthly water bill, 
the low hanging fruit might be doing some efficiency work to a sprinkler system. Um, we've done that and continue to do that for a lot of the large HOAs that we manage. Um, typically we can save at least 10%, but sometimes up to 30% of that monthly or annual water cost, um, which is just huge for the HOA's budget um, since water is often one of the largest expenses. Um, so that's, that's one place to start is kind of doing a review of the um, monthly utilities. Um, uh, just to tie it back to the sort of community sustainability as well, um, one of the things that CAP management has done in the last year is conducted a sustainability survey for residents. And this gives us a good idea of what residents are actually asking for. So, you know, we can come in as sustainability consultants and, you know, recommend best practices, but if the community doesn't care about it, then the longevity and the durability of those projects often will kind of fizzle out um, as, you know, as we take a step back. So I think, you know, getting that interest and actually responding to the um, to the needs and, and passions of the community members um, will really go a long way. And that's probably going to be where the most successful sustainability projects originate from. All right, um, here's one more. We are about to embark on our annual discussion and disagreement about what temperature to set our outdoor pool. Any suggestions for situations where not everyone will be happy with our decision? Okay, Andy and Spencer, you guys talked a lot about communication. Any tips on this one? <laughs> yeah, um, but first I think it, it's good to get a baseline to see what residents are thinking in terms of temperature. Uh, where do they, like what's the most popular, I guess, temperature of the pool? Uh, but another thing you can do once, uh, once you decide on temperature, if you wanna retain heat, uh, especially in the summer, is to cover it at night. Uh, that, that way you'll use less energy heating the pool because it'll keep it covered, it'll keep it insulated, and you'll also lose less water to evaporation because um, here out uh, in the front range, it's very dry. So water tends to evaporate pretty fast. Um, yeah. yeah, I think, you know, for, for something like this, for a community-wide decision that's, you know, always going to be something that people have an opinion or feedback on. Um, I would just err on the side of communication. Um, you know, let residents know um, that they can receive a copy of the meeting minutes where, you know, the discussion was had on what temperature to set the pool and the reasons why. Um, you know, and then if if that's something that needs to be reviewed throughout the summer, um, you know, I would encourage board members to invite um, people to meetings to actually have the discussion um, rather than, you know, uh, talk about it um, in more of the kind of gossip context. So, um, yeah, I think, you know, justify your decision, put it out there, and also be willing to accept feedback on it um, through some sort of formal process, which the best place to do that is at community meetings. Okay, guys, and we've got one more question back to the projects, um, the low hanging fruit projects that we went over. Which which of these projects have you found HOAs are most willing to adopt? I think that really depends on the community that you're talking about. Um, I think the easiest in terms of getting people on board is probably conservation or efficiency um, just from a purely upfront money standpoint. Um, so, I mean, money's certainly a motivator and showing people how much they can save with those sort of things are a great way to get people on board with that. Um, but, yeah, I, mean, I agree. I, I think, you know, having the the financial argument and some sort of cost saving initiative is 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 really attractive for HOAs to adopt, especially at the board level. Um, another consideration is to think about potential eyesores or kind of pain points that the community is having. So we find this a lot with landscaping, you know, especially with large landscapes, there's there's always going to be areas that um, could look a little better maybe. And, you know, areas that people have complained about, um, you know, the grass never stays there or this old shrub needs to be um, removed and replaced. 
So I think combining projects, sustainability projects with conservation and cost savings initiatives, and also enhancing the kind of visual appeal of an HOA are projects that, um, you know, check multiple boxes and you typically get a lot of support for projects that, that can do both. All right, well, thanks everyone for all the great questions. Um, we do appreciate that. If you have any additional questions, please get in touch with us. Um, these are some ways that you can stay connected with what we're doing at CAP Management. So like I said, this was part three of a, a three-part series. And so you will be able to view the video recordings of the two other webinars as well. We'll be posting those on our Facebook as well as our website, capmanagement.com. Uh, if you are on capmanagement.com, please take our 10-minute sustainability quiz. It's a short 30-question quiz that gives you a little scorecard on where your community ranks in terms of sustainability. Uh, I've also included the link here to our sustainable HOA network that exists on LinkedIn. Again, really good place to connect with a larger um, network and like-minded folks who are working on projects at this scale. Um, if you're interested in sort of a deeper dive into any of these topics, uh, we will be presenting at the Community Associations Institute. That's the trade group for the HOA industry um, at the fall conference, which will be um, scheduled for November 12th, 2020 right now. And we'll be teaching a one hour class on sustainability for HOAs. Um, if you're a property manager, you'll also get a one hour continuing education credit um, for that class. And we'll also be co-presenting with an HOA board president and water conservation activist um, named Don Ireland from a large community in South Denver. So we hope that you all found this information valuable and hopefully useful for your community. Again, please don't hesitate to reach out with any additional questions or feedback. Thanks again to everyone for attending. We appreciate your support and we will see you next time. Take care.